Today we're going to be looking at this issue of the persecuted church, and the title of my message is Suffering Before Glory. Walter Kaiser, the Old Testament theologian, posited that the Bible could be condensed into a tripartite formula, a three-part summary. One, Jehovah will be our God, and we will be his people. Two, he will dwell amongst us and bless us. And three, he will make us a blessing to all the peoples of the earth. Another theologian summarized in a little more succinct way the Old Testament this way. They tried to kill us. We survived. Let's eat. (laughs) This morning, as we remember the persecuted church, we also remember that suffering precedes glory. We remember that in these last days, and I realize this is a little prophetic because I am forecasting to you what will come to America as it has come to the other parts of the world. But in these last days, they are going to try to kill us. We will endure. And one fine day, the trumpet will sound. The Lord will descend with a shout, sin and death will be vanquished forever. Jesus will reign over all of the nations and we will, at the great marriage supper of the Lamb, sit down to eat. Jesus is coming and he's going to make all things right. But until that day and that feast, we are no different from the Christ that we adore. What they did to him, they're going to do to us. And it is not enough to pray for the suffering church. It is not enough to pay for the suffering church. We must be the suffering church. As Jesus had to suffer to provide redemption for all peoples, even so must we in our day with Paul rejoice in what we are suffering and fill up in our flesh what is still lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of the body, which is the church. When it comes to global missions, suffering must and will precede glory. And what is that glory that makes this suffering worthwhile? The glory of every tribe and people and tongue gathered around Jehovah's throne. There is no other path for us. There is no other way to the redemption of the nations. There is no other path to the return of the king. Now we all love Philippians 3, at least the first two clauses. I want to know Christ. Amen? I want to know the power of his resurrection. Hallelujah. What comes next? And I want to know the fellowship of his sufferings. And the context of that verse is Jesus suffering for the redemption of the world. And what this simply means is there is a knowledge of God only attained when we join him in daily suffering for the redemption of the world. And on this Sunday, where we remember brothers and sisters who are being persecuted around the world, I just want to say, don't feel sorry for those persecuted believers or those suffering missionaries, because they know God in a way that we cannot if we only stay in church or at home. There is a presence of God in prison cells that cannot be reproduced in an air-conditioned hall with a carpeted altar. There is a knowledge of Jesus made more real where Satan has his throne and is attacking our very life. There is an intimacy, there is a wonder, there is a beauty that is only found when we hang on crosses. There is a fellowship with Jesus that we can only know if we shed our blood with him for the redemption of the nations. In the United Arab Emirates in 1960, before they became a country, two missionary doctors named the Kennedys rented an old Land Rover and they drove into the desert. They found an old oasis town, catchment area of about 1,500 
And they found a, a Bedouin woman who had been trying to give birth for three days and was about to pass away, mother and baby. And so they were able to save that woman's life. And so the sheikh, who was the tribal leader of that area, gave them permission to start a clinic. And later on, that sheikh, his name was Sheikh Saeed, became the president, the founder of the United Arab Emirates. His sons were born at this clinic. It became a hospital. And one of those sons was named Mohammed bin Zaid, who is now the president of the Emirates. And perhaps the most respected and most powerful Arab in all of the world today. You'll see on the screens a picture here of Sheikh Mohammed. It was taken in 1962. And he's being held in the arms of Dr. Marion Kennedy. And you can see the joy in her face. And that little boy in that picture now is the most powerful Arab in all the world. He is behind the peace agreements with Israel. He's behind the Abrahamic Accords. He's behind the tolerance that's coming out of Dubai and the other emirates. He's behind a lot of the peace treaties that are being brokered behind the scenes. That little boy in the arms of that missionary woman. Now in the early days of that clinic, there was no electricity. And so the staff had to create their own blood bank. And they made a little list of their blood types on the wall. And Marion Kennedy was O negative, which is the universal blood donor. And so when there was no blood to be offered, Dr. Kennedy gave her blood. She is revered to this day in the Emirates because she was known to always give her blood and save other patients. One day she was operating and a woman began to hemorrhage, so she scrubbed out, donated her blood, scrubbed back in, saved the mother and the child's life. And she did this so often that she lived anemic. She was always tired, she was always weary, she was always a little sickly because she was always giving her blood to save Muslim women and then their children, that they might live and hear about Jesus. Because Mary and Kennedy knew that suffering precedes glory. Now, it's one thing to be spent for the gospel, to be poured out as a drink offering, as Paul said. It is another thing to be persecuted for the gospel. And we must be willing to donate our blood in both endeavors. And I base this on Acts chapter 16. It's the story of Paul going to Philippi. And the first lady he meets, Lydia at the river, she comes to faith and she gives her house as a place for Paul to begin the church. This haven for believers created at Lydia's house is soon under threat because as Paul and Silas began to evangelize, they're accosted by this demoniac, the spirit of the python, the text actually says, who is following them, troubling them. And so Paul casts out the spirit. And that was problematic to the merchants because they were making money off of this servant girl. And so Paul and Silas are arrested and they're taken before the magistrates. And the text says, many stripes, lashes were laid upon them. They're jailed in that bloodied condition. They're chained to the wall. They sing all night. And then an earthquake. And in Acts 16, verse 36, after that earthquake, the story you know so well, the magistrates send to Paul and Silas and say, please just leave the city. Which, if you know the story at that point, Paul responds and says, nope, I'm a Roman citizen. Now, my question, because there's more going on here that meets the Western eye, why did Paul play the Roman card at that juncture in the story? After he was beaten, after he was bloodied, after he was chained in prison, why didn't he just say that on the front end? If he's going to claim that status on the back end, why didn't he just say it before he was bloody? What's going on here culturally? Well, in the ancient Near East, there was a patron-client system. Patrons had power and provided resources and opportunities to their clients. Clients received those benefits and then provided honorable service in return. Now in this scenario then, that Roman Greek understanding, at the beginning of the story, the magistrates have the power. They can put Paul in prison. They can do punishment. They're the ones that have the power. But they make a critical mistake because by Roman law, no Roman citizen can be punished without due process. It's where we get our precedent in law today. And when they punish 
a Roman citizen without trial, without due process. There is a power inversion, and now they no longer have the power. Paul now has the power because all he has to do is report those magistrates to the Roman governor, and because they violated Roman law, which was so important to the cohesion of the empire, they could lose their status, they could lose their income, they could lose their job. And so they come, cap in hand, oh, Paul, we're so sorry. We didn't know that you were a Roman. Please just leave town and don't cause us any trouble. Now, the answer to the question on why Paul didn't claim that status before he was bloodied and imprisoned is given to us in the last verse of Acts 16. Because right before Paul leaves town, he goes back to Lydia's house. And you know what he's doing culturally? Remember, now he has status. Now the magistrates don't want him upset. They want him to be pleased. So he takes that status and he conveys it on Lydia and her house. And by visiting that house, he is sending this message in an indirect culture. And he's saying, you see this woman and you see the church in her house there with me. I'm leaving town. But if you lift one finger against this church, I'm coming back and I will report you to the authorities, and life as you know it is over. He gives to Lydia and that nation, that baby church, his protection, only possible because he bled. If he would not have suffered, there would have not been this power inversion, and he would not have been able to convey status on the infant church. And the church is protected, and the gospel goes forward because a missionary was willing to, to bleed. Now, he could have avoided that pain. He could have just prayed. He could have sent a check. But instead, he bled. What about you? What Roman card do you carry? And are you willing to give it up? It's not wrong to be American. It's not wrong to enjoy the privileges of our civic society. It's not wrong to be retired. It's not wrong to have a boat and a cabin on Spencer Lake. It's not wrong to have an IRA. It's not wrong to live near family. It's not wrong to enjoy free babysitting. None of those are sins. But is there anyone here willing to give those up, willing to bleed a little bit for the glory on the other side of whatever that sacrifice might cost you, that the nations might be redeemed? For the glory that will only come when the sufferings of Jesus have been filled up for the redemption of the nations. Is there anyone here willing to suffer a little bit for the global glory of Jesus? Is there anyone here willing to join brothers and sisters around the world who themselves have bled and all through history men and women have bled for the glory of that shall be revealed. I'd like to illustrate this with some contemporary examples and some historic ones, and then I'm going to make some applications. Adam was a co-worker with us in Sudan. My wife and I lived in the Sudan for 15 years. He was from the Nuba Mountains. He was a follower of Jesus. And in 2012, when all of the missionaries were kicked out of Sudan, those local believers who remained behind paid the price. Adam was arrested because of his work in ministry with us, and he was put in prison. He was shamed by being confined to a toilet one yard by one yard square, the hole in the middle of it. He had to sit there, sleep there, deal with that stench and smell for day after day, week after week, month after month. And in order to make it even more shameful, it was the main toilet for the prison, and they would send the prisoners to that toilet, and Adam would have to stay in it and press himself against the wall as the prisoners would relieve themselves. They wanted to shame him, so he had a choice. He could shrink into that shame, or he could rise to proclaim. And he chose to lift up Jesus. And so everyone who came to the toilet, Adam would stand there and lay his hands on them while they're doing their business, and he'd pray for them, and he'd talk to them about Jesus, and he'd give them a word of encouragement or offer them a verse whether they were Muslim or Christian. And the guards began to notice that everyone who went to that toilet came out smiling. 
And so something wasn't working. So one of the guards dressed up in shabby clothes as a prisoner and went in to see what was going on in that toilet. And Adam ministered to that guard as he went to the bathroom. They realized that they weren't getting anywhere, so they released Adam from prison. And some months later, he was sitting on a bus in the city of Khartoum, and an Arab Muslim man approached him, came down, sat on his bus bench next to him, and said, you might not recognize me, but I was that guard that came into your toilet. And you began to share with me about Jesus, and my imagination has been kindled. I can't forget what you said. I want to know more. I know that I need a Savior. Can you tell me more about Jesus? Adam took that guard's hands in his own, shared the gospel with him, led him to the Lord, and prayed the sinner's prayer with him right there in that city bus. But it started back in the shame of being confined to a toilet because glory always follows suffering. Eritrea is perhaps the most Marxist country on earth today. Pastor Kiflu, one of our Assemblies of God partners from Eritrea, has been in prison for the last 20 years. He remains there today. He hasn't seen his children in those two decades. On the night when he was taken, his daughter and son were just little ankle biters And they watched as the police took their dad out into the street and loaded him into this paddy wagon to drive him away. And the little boy, just a few years old, began to cry. His sister, probably around seven years old at the time or so, she corrected him. Oh, no, brother, don't cry. Father told us this would happen. And in this moment, he told us what to do. And that little child in that Eritrean street at night, hasn't seen her father in 20 years, she threw back her head and unleashed what in Arabic is called a zagrata. It is that piercing ululation of celebration, usually used at weddings or celebrations. And she began in her cultural way to praise the Lord. And her little infant brother joined her and two little Eritrean children in the language and culture of their beloved nation, stood in the street, watched their father travel off into the night, and they haven't seen him since, and they praised the Lord. How do you think Jesus felt in that moment as he looked down in love? Don't you think his heart burst? Maybe a tear came to his eye. Was he not magnified and glorified in that precious moment? Was there not glory in that suffering, two little children exercising the privileges of earth, praising a worthy Jesus through their pain. It is a privilege we will not have in heaven. In heaven there will be no tears, no night, no death, no sin. All will be bliss, all will be well, and that will be a different kind of joy. But we have a privilege on earth to praise the Lord in our pain and to praise Him when things are not right. For the glory that follows suffering. Lawrence also praised Jesus through pain. He was martyred in Rome August 10th, 258 A.D. Emperor Valerian had issued an edict that all Christian leaders be put to death and their property confiscated. Sextus II, the bishop of Rome, was executed. On his way to his execution, Lawrence called out to him as he was being led. He said, Oh, my father, will you go to heaven and leave me behind? Sextus replied with a smile, Be comforted, Lawrence. You'll join me in three days. Lawrence was arrested. He was the treasurer of the church. The emperor thought he had a lot of money. He asked for all the wealth of the church. Lawrence said, give me three days. He collected all of the widows and all of the orphans. He brought them to the emperor. He said, here, here's the wealth of the church. Emperor was not amused, so he ordered the death of Lawrence. Lawrence was roasted alive on a gridiron, a metal grate. He submitted bravely, and in the middle of that torture... He said to his executioner with a smile, you may turn me over now, I'm done on this side. And then with his last breath, he prayed for the people of Rome and then he died. What is it in a little child in Eritrea that praises the Lord when their father is carried off into the night? What is it in a young man in Rome 
who cracks a joke while his flesh is being roasted because of his faith in Jesus. And is that in you and in me? I'd like to just give three simple applications for us as we remember those who are suffering around the world this morning. Number one, if Lawrence can crack a joke while he's being roasted alive, and if Eritrean children can praise the Lord when they lose their father, we can endure our smaller suffering. My first application may surprise you, but in light of what Jesus has done and what others have experienced around the world, I want to urge you, stay on your cross. Whatever your trial, large or small, the only way to resurrection power is if you endure to the end. It will be the same for us as it was for Jesus. Suffering will precede glory. And we only get to resurrection power if we're 100% dead. Stay on your cross. Endure it to the end. Don't wiggle off 80% dead. Don't descend 99% crucified. If you extract yourself from a difficult situation that God in sovereignty has brought you through for the glory that He determines on the other side of that suffering, all you'll end up with is mutilated body, heart, soul, and spirit. But if you will stay on your cross all the way to God's determined end, the result of that is the glory of resurrection. And we don't get resurrection power unless we're all the way dead. Stay on your cross. Die to pride. Die to reputation. Die to status. Die to the opinion of men. Die to the things that the world wants to impress upon you. Die to that. And if you stay on that cross, you'll get resurrection power. But if you wiggle off it prematurely, all you have is wounds and scars. I'm not talking about staying in an abusive situation. I'm not talking about things that are twisted and perverted. But when God ordains, because of His name, that you go through trial, stay on the cross. Because if you will, there's glory on the other side. There's resurrection power if we will stay on our cross. Secondly, you can pray for laborers to go around the world. I'd like to ask everyone to take out your cell phone. Would you just take your cell phone out, hold it in your hand, and open up the application that you would have where you would set an alarm. I think on most of your smartphone, smartphones you have that. We're going to give uh, sacrificially, momentarily, but if I can be candid with you, what is needed mostly on the field is more missionaries, not more money. And in order for us to get more missionaries, we need more prayer. So I'd like you to set your alarm for 10.02 in the morning. Could you just all do that? Take a moment. You'll see a picture up here of my phone. I have my phone set for 10.02 every morning. And the reason is simply this. Luke chapter 10 verse 2 tells us to pray to the Lord of the harvest to send forth laborers into the harvest field. I want to invite you as an application. You might be thinking, wow, this is a heavy message. He's talking about staying on the cross. He's talking about suffering. He's talking about persecution. People cracking jokes while they're being burned alive. That's just not my reality. Well, this can be your reality. Every one of us can pray that the Lord would send laborers into the harvest field. That's an application you can walk out of this room with, right? So would you join me and many others around the world in praying that Jesus would raise up laborers for the harvest field. And when your alarm goes off at 10.02 every morning, just take 30 seconds or a minute and say, Lord, would you raise up from our church an army of missionaries to go into the world? Thirdly, you can answer that prayer I've just asked you to pray yourself. As a missionary, I am so grateful for every dollar that you generously give to support my family and others, and that you will give at the close of this service. You are so kind to sacrificially help us and those who suffer around the world. I do want to remind you, however, that when the Father looked down at children in pain on this earth, 
he sent something more valuable than money. He sent his son. And I want to ask of you the same. It is neither biblical nor just that only non-Americans suffer for following Jesus. It is not possible for us to pay for others to suffer on our behalf or to think that we can purchase an exemption from suffering for the gospel advance by sending money. In fact, the deepest response regarding the persecuted church is solidarity. That word compassion means to suffer with. And if we're really compassionate, we don't stand at a distance, even through the wonderful means of prayers and finances, but we embrace the one who is suffering and we join them in their suffering. And we leave home and we leave safety to become a missionary to the unreached in the places and contexts of persecution where Jesus is not wanted and not worshipped. And we live there, we preach the gospel there, we make disciples there, we suffer there, we live there, and we die there. That is the greatest need of the world today. Jesus is worth that. And on the screen, you'll see a QR code. And again, if you have your phone, if you are interested in becoming a missionary, you can take a picture of this QR code and it will begin a conversation with us. And we'll walk through that with you and with your pastoral staff. But this is the greatest need in missions today, is for those who will say, I'll bleed a little bit for the glory of the nations around the throne on the other side of suffering. Let me close with this small anecdote. Helen Rosviar was a woman well acquainted with difficulty. She was a missionary in Central Africa where during a time of rebellion, she was gang raped by soldiers. Looking back, she said, one has tried to count the cost, but I find it all swallowed up in privilege. The cost suddenly seems very small and transient in the greatness and permanence of privilege. My friend Faraz would agree with Helen. He's a colleague that was on our team in Benghazi, Libya. He sits now in a Libyan jail with a death sentence hanging over his head, as do about a half dozen other Libyan believers with him. Their crime, loving Jesus and proclaiming him. Their fate, the privilege of suffering before glory. What can we do today for the persecuted church? We can love Jesus so fiercely that to suffer and sacrifice for him and for the gospel to go to all the world is considered a privilege. We can give generously of our finances for those who suffer. We can pray steadfastly that God would raise up more laborers for the field. And best of all, we can give them the great gift of our presence. We can go, live, suffer, die with them. We can go proclaim Jesus in hostile contexts because he's worth it and because the nations will not be reached without sacrifice. They will try to kill us. We will survive. And then we'll eat. Would you bow your heads? Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you didn't wiggle off your cross. You stayed on it for the redemption of the nations. You could have saved yourself, but wouldn't have been able to save us. Lord, let this difficult and beautiful truth go deep into our hearts that it's the same for us. We can save ourselves and escape persecution. But if we do that, the nations will not be saved. So would you give men and women in this house 
a vision of the Holy Spirit and courage in their bones to say, the glory of Jesus, the worth of Jesus, the praise of Jesus by all the nations, that glory is worth suffering. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Would you give Dick a big hand? So to all of our campuses, we're going to get ready to give you an opportunity to give. And so at every campus, uh, there's going to be opportunities that are on the screen. Uh, so there's an envelope that's on the seat there, this greater envelope. You can put money in that. Uh, if you're writing a check today, you can write it to Life Church, And uh, all, everything will go. I'm going to tell you about a couple of opportunities in particular to give in just a moment. But you'll be able to do that. You can actually text to give. You can do it uh, online. You can do it multiple ways, again, that are on the screen. That's going to be up the entire time that I'm talking. You begin to prepare. Um, we do this a few times a year where we do a special offering kind of above and beyond. And every year we take a, a weekend to talk about the persecuted church. And uh, I knew that today was going to be heavy. I knew that today was going to be like, Wow. Uh, I don't want to stand behind Dick Brogdon when, when we're standing before the Lord, amen? And many, many other people, all the people that he's talked about. Um, today's not a day to, the enemy of your soul will try to make you feel bad for what you have and for where you are in the world. And all that will do will create a malaise and a kind of a melancholy type of a feel on your day that will evaporate because the week will come and things will happen and life will happen and you'll forget about it. I encourage you, no, 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 no. No, you're the church that has the ability to do something about what he's talking about. Don't let the enemy come in and, and do that in you. No, what do you have the ability to do? So pray. So Ryan le leaned over to me, said at 10.02, which will be in seven minutes now, alarms are probably going to be going off throughout the prayers we're praying. So just be mindful of that. That happened. Just turn it off. No big deal. But pray. Pray for laborers. Um, go. Again, this, this Wednesday night as we do our revival night, the whole theme about that is about being called into vocational ministry. And I believe that God is raising up a generation of this Gen Z that is coming into, into their own that is going to really usher in what God's going to do. I don't know why the enemy has tried to knock out millennials and Gen Zs the way that he has, but there has been this onslaught from hell. But yet God is at work, and he is moving in, amaz in amazing ways among this generation. So we want to champion that. But not just that. There are some of you that are my age, that you're at a retirement place, that instead of just getting a place on Spencer Lake like Dick talked about, you could maybe go to a different part of the world, maybe give of this season of your life. I don't know what God's asking, but ask him. He'll speak. You want to talk about a bold prayer? That's a bold prayer. Some of you are ready for me to get to the offering. I've never seen people so ready for me to take an offering in all of my life. And the third thing is, is you can give today. Financially, everything you give is going to go to the persecuted church. There are 15 missionaries that serve in what we would call the persecuted church, the persecuted areas of the world. $45,000 a year goes to support those missionaries, anywhere from $30 a month to $500 a month. There are about $100,000 of our missions budget that goes for organizations that come alongside and work in what we would call the persecuted church areas of the world, from Asia to, to communist countries to the Middle East to India, all through there. Today, there's three projects, too, I just want to tell you about that, that we've committed to give to. And it's to persecuted believers that Dick has made us aware of, a, a Yemen believer who, who was in prison and had to be evacuated to Egypt. So $5,000 helps them establish and help and minister in that situation. A Pakistani partner who's now being held in a Libyan prison, and so in order to, to take care of his needs and the needs of his family, again, $5,000. There are several Libyan believers that are held in prison today. And when they go to prison, especially if it's the, the, the breadwinner of the family, the family is destitute. This is all part of the plan in order to, you want to be a Christian, then we're, it's going to cost you everything. So what do we do? We pray. 
We ask God if he wants us to go. And we give. We give. So that's $5,000 for a family who's been in prison for their faith. So today, whether you're wanting to say, man, I, I, just want, I, I only have a limited amount. $15 helps, helps someone that, that's, that's being sex trafficked. That's, that's basically a medical care for a month trying to come out of that world and minister uh, $30 to $500 a month pays for missionary support of one of these missionaries $1,000 basically with Global University helps us to be able to educate someone in a country to, to be a pastor, a leader in that country in order to do what God's called them to do and again $5,000 for a family who's been in prison for their faith currently right now um, these are the needs these are the opportunities so I'm just going to ask you today to give, whether it's $15, whether it's $30, whether it's $500, whether it's $1,000, whether it's $5,000. That we will give. This is what we can do. It was a little over a year ago, Ryan and I were in Dubai. And I had met Dick Brogdon before. I knew who he was. I had read some of his writings. I had been around I had various friends that, that knew him and, and some colleagues that were in contact with him. But this was the first time that I had really been in his presence, so to speak. And some of the buddies that we were with, some of, I say buddies and pastor friends that were there, kind of blamed me for, Aaron, we'd just be quiet. We're all wanting to go home, back to the hotel, because you're just jet lag and you're asking questions. But he really messed me up. And challenged. The first missionary that I've ever heard that says, I don't really need your money, I need your people. The people that you're pastoring, would you please give an invitation, an opportunity for them to come be a part? Just a couple weeks ago, our Life Leadership College, they went to Muscat, Oman, which is where we, Ryan and I, were there as well as a part of that trip. And uh, again, it messed me up. Because again, I don't, that's not what God's called me to do. God's called me to pastor and I, wow. And I can either have this sense of melancholy, whatever, oh, woe is me, but that's going to drift because things are going to happen and phone calls are going to happen. I've got meetings and sermons to prepare for and life to happen. Or I can dig in and go, God, what do you want us to do? And it's one thing I told Ryan, we've got to try to get him to come and speak. I know it'll be heavy. I know it'll be thought-provoking. But it'll be convicting, but it, we need, it's a message we need to hear. Do you agree? Because this is what it's like in most of the world. So I'm going to pray today. It's 10.01. Those alarms are going to go off in about 60 seconds. And I'm going to pray for this offering. And I'm going to ask that everybody does something. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, I guess... If you want to throw some bucks in the plate, we will take it, no question. I won't turn anything down but my collar. But, uh, but at the end of the day, we can all do something. And thank you, Dick, for being here. Thank you for living this out and for leading. Let's pray. Father, as the ushers are coming right now as I speak at every campus with buckets in hand, and they're walking to the front. I pray, God, as we have our offering in our hands, whether it's been digital and it's on our phones and we've texted or we've done something that's online and we, we've given, Lord, or whether it's a cash that's in our, our hand or it's a check in an envelope, God, I pray that you'd bless it and that you'd use it. God, I pray you would do what you did at the feeding of the 5,000. When you took it, and you blessed it, and you broke it, and then you gave it. And there was more left over than what they began with. God, I pray for our brothers and sisters around the world that are in prison for their faith. Families that are torn apart just for one simple thing. That's because they have a faith in Jesus Christ. I pray, God, for the persecuted church and for the suffering church. I, I don't even feel qualified to pray, but I just pray, God, in some way, Lord. I just pray, Lord, bring glory 
strength, help. I pray, Holy Spirit, let the prayers of every believer at every campus today, God, be felt. I pray, Lord, touch our hearts and let us not quickly forget that suffering does indeed precede glory. And this is something that in all of our ways we deal with this side of eternity. God, I just pray, help us. Speak to us. If we're to go, let us go. If we're to give of our sons and daughters, our nieces and nephews, our, our grandchildren, Lord, God, to whom you call, go. But Lord, as much as you've given us, let us be faithful with what you've given us. With where you've placed us in the world and your sovereignty and in your wisdom, help us, Lord, to be faithful in that place. Faithful to serve the communities that you put us into. Faithful to seek the welfare of these cities. Faithful to, to stand with brothers and sisters, not just in our own community, but around the corner and around the world. Faithful to give and to go and to pray and to do as much as we have the ability to. And God, we pray that you would put your super onto our natural and that you would do exceedingly and abundantly. You would do greater than all we could think or ask. I pray for your people today. I pray for your blessings today. And I pray, God, for the persecuted church in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you as you give. The ushers are going to begin to pass the buckets at every campus. And you can begin to, to give in your offerings right there. You're going to see a quick video and then the campus pastors are going to come back. God bless you again.